Hello once again and welcome to the Generations Bible Study of St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Ken Jobst and I'm just so pleased that you have joined us for this continuing study of the Song of Solomon. This week we'll be looking at the Song of Solomon chapter 5, so if you would like to get your Bible or uh, just follow along in the message notes, that's certainly fine. As we closed last, last time's study, we were looking in chapter 4 of the Song of Solomon, and the closing verse of chapter 4 says, and this is the Shulamite, says, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south, blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat of its pleasant fruits. Now, last time we had mentioned that in ancient Near Eastern poetry, uh, fruits were often used at, in a symbolic way to designate sexual intimacy. And so the references to the apples, the raisin cakes, so on and so forth that we see in the Song of Solomon, that can be understood in many instances as um, a kind of a, a, a sexual connotation that goes along with that. Now, we open up chapter 5, and in chapter 5, verse 1, the, the speaker is the beloved, and the beloved says, I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh and my incense. I have eaten of my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. So that's chapter 5, verse 1, the first half of verse 1. I've come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. Now, last time, understand that that, that phrase, my sister, my spouse, is an ancient Near Eastern figure of speech to say, my dearest friend, my spouse. So it's not, it's not a connotation of incest or anything like that. It's just a colloquial, colloquial way of expressing uh, deep friendship. And our spouse should be our closest friend. But I've come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh and my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Now, the first thing that we notice in this first half of this verse is that the, the beloved is using the first person possessive pronoun, my. Uses it nine times in this first half of a, a verse. So he's, he is personalizing to, to, to the, the, the nth degree. He's personalizing this relationship with the Shulamite. And, and he, watch how he uses the language here, because he gives double terms in three instances. So it's like a superlative doubled. And the three, the three terms or, or three notions that are being um, amplified here, we've got the pairing of the terms myrrh and spice. So that's a poetic way of saying that their love is like an appealing fragrance. We've got the pairing of the honeycomb and the honey. And that's a poetic way to, to say that their relationship is characterized by sweetness. And then we've got the pairing of wine and milk. And as we've seen before, both of these, both of these beverages, right? Wine is indicative of celebration and milk sustains us. So it's the notion of sustaining the celebration. Put another way, sustaining the joy. So these three pairs, myrrh and spice, honeycomb and honey, and wine and milk, are all uh, poetic testimonies to the relationship that exists between the Shulamite and her beloved, which is Solomon. Now, I want to make it very clear here, um, verse 1a, this verse that we've just read, is clearly a, a reference to the couple's complete satisfaction in the context of their sexual intimacy. So we had, we had seen the, the, the wedding night earlier, and this is a, an affirmation that they, they are both completely satisfied with their sexual relationship. 
And by the way, that, that, opening, that opening verse, I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. Now, heretofore, we have always seen the garden as a protected space, as a, a, a space that was set apart. This is the first indication where we have the, the beloved entering into the garden. And once again, that means pretty much what you think it means. Yeah, th th this, is, this is a reference to their sexual intimacy. Now, um, let's continue with the second half of verse 1. In the second half of verse 1, we have these words. Eat, O friends. Drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. Now, understand that in different, uh, different translations, the speakers are attributed differently. And I'm following the New King James Version where these lines, these three lines, are actually attributed to the friends of Solomon. Eat, O friends. Drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. Now, I, you know, not, not to raise contention with respected Bible scholars, but I would have to say it would be highly unusual to have friends around in the bedroom on the wedding night, especially friends that would be cheering you on or you would be cheering them on with phrases like, eat, O friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. Look, that's not Solomon's friends saying that. I, 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 <laughs> I don't believe that's what's going on here. Now, who would be saying Eat, O oh friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O oh beloved ones. Well, I'd like to propose that the speaker of these three lines in the second half of verse 1 of Song of Solomon, chapter 5, I would like to suggest that the speaker there is actually God, that that is a divine affirmation of their their the physical consummation of their love within the context of marriage. So eat and drink are clearly veiled, you know, slightly veiled references to sexual activity. And I, I just, um, I just believe this is not the friends of Solomon saying this. This is God's affirmation of sexuality, sexual expression within the context of marriage. Eat, oh friends, Drink, yes, drink deeply, O oh, beloved ones. So, although God is never explicitly mentioned in the book of Song of Solomon, uh, that God, is, God is not explicitly mentioned by, uh, by his covenant name, Yahweh, or in any other manner, I do believe that these three lines are to be understood to have been spoken by God. Okay, now... So there we've got the, there we, we come to a turning point in the Song of Solomon. So we've had the scene, the, uh, the little scene of the, the wedding. We've seen the wedding banquet. We've been able to see a little bit of what goes on in the wedding chamber. And it's all, it's all summed up in these three lines that I attribute to, you know, God saying, Eat, O friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. Now, that's trans the transition. That's a transitional verse. And we move on. And most commentators agree that there is to be understood a time gap between verse 1 and verse 2 in chapter 5. The length of this time gap is anybody's guess. But the idea is the scene has shifted away from the wedding night, away from the, the wedding chamber. Time has gone by. I don't know, weeks, months, maybe a year or so. But uh, some commentators would say that right here in chapter, chapter 5, verse 2, we find that the honeymoon is over. And so let's see what happens in verses 2 through 6. By the way, the speaker here is the Shulamite, is Mrs. Solomon. Verse 2 reads, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. 
He knocks, saying, Open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved puts his hand by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. I rose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am lovesick. Woo! Wow! Wow! What's going on in this passage? This, this is... Okay. Uh, we got to figure this out. Something's going on here. Now... So much of this is going to depend on how we understand the very first part of verse 2, in which the Shulamite says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Now, most commentators, and I'm, I'm also of the opinion, that this phrase actually means she is asleep, but she's dreaming. I sleep but my heart is awake. So the idea here is that the Shulamite is having a bad dream. Uh, there are other commentators that would say, now hold up. It could be that she is, you know, I sleep, but my heart is awake, meaning I'm in bed, but I'm restless, and I actually can't sleep because I have so many thoughts going in my head. Now, so I'll, I'll leave it to your discretion as we continue, but the big question here is, is Shulamite having a dream? And are we to understand what happens in this sequence as, as a dream? Or is this really happening in some regard? Is this happening in real time and space? Now, or, or, watch this. Is it some kind of uh, combination of the two? Well, let's explore. Let's see. Now, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Watch, there's a sequence that's going to happen in this dream or in however we want to understand what's going on. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. Now, what we're going to see in this passage is that the beloved actually makes six appeals for admittance to go into the Shulamite. Six, some people could even say seven. But, but there are six named appeals that Solomon, you know, the beloved, is making to the Shulamite to gain admittance. And, and the first of these is the appeal of his voice. She is either asleep or she's on her bed, restless. She hears Solomon's voice, the voice of her husband, speaking to her. So there's that the, the appeal of his voice. When you recognize someone's voice, right, you, you hear someone that you know outside, isn't that an appeal to open the door to them? Okay, secondly, the second appeal is, in verse 2, he knocks. So, so not only is there the appeal that, oh, I hear his voice, there's the second appeal that he's knocking on the door. Well, that, that might raise the question, well, it's his house, right? I mean, do you knock on your own door when you go home at night? But, but watch, and, and maybe this is part of that, you know, crazy dream sequence type thing. 
but she hears his his voice and she hears his knocking now what's that remind you of someone standing at the door and knocking behold i stand at the door and knock revelation chapter 3 verse 20 this is jesus knocking on the door of the church at Laodicea, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears, you know, I'll come in and, and commune with them, right? So watch. This is a, a reasonably developed sequence in which we, we've got Solomon knocking on the door to be gained or to be granted admission to the bride. Oh, wait, it's starting to make a whole lot more sense, right? So, so Solomon the groom is wanting to come into the bride. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, remember, Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Now, if, if we pursue this, if we pursue this notion that, uh, that, that's going on here of the, the groom outside the bride the bride's chamber, knocking, then Revelation 3.20 becomes a reference to the Song of Solomon. Right? Song of Solomon came first. Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That image of someone standing on the door, standing at the door and knocking, that's an image that comes directly from Song of Solomon. So, if we accept that interpretation, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 is the only New Testament reference to the Song of Solomon. So maybe, oh my goodness, maybe we need to be paying some attention along that direction. The direction of the groom and the bride, the direction of Christ and the church. Now, earlier I said let's not get all carried away with allegory and that sort of thing. But there, there's some symbolism you just can't ignore, and I think this is part of that. We're talking about the appeals that the beloved is making to the Shulamite who is inside. He's on the outside. There's the appeal of his voice. There's the appeal of his knocking. Third, there's the appeal of his specific request. He says, open for me, right? Open for me. He, you know, it's not just that you, you, you hear him shuffling around outside. It's not just that you hear his knock, but you hear his voice saying, open for me. Then, fourth, you've got the appeal of, watch this, his terms of endearment. He uses these four different affectionate names for the Shulamite. He says, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. So it's clear that he loves the bride. He's making that exceptionally crystal clear that he has love for the bride. And then, verse 5. Oh, excuse me. The, the, not verse 5, but the fifth appeal. Once again, we've got the appeal of his voice, the appeal of his knocking, the appeal of his specific request, the appeal of his use of terms of endearment, and then fifth, we've got the appeal of the expression of his discomfort. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. Now, now you know, it, it's not literally raining on him, but he's standing outside in the wet, in the damp at night, he is uncomfortable and would much rather be inside with the Shulamite. Didn't Christ suffer discomfort on our behalf? Right? And doesn't Christ use terms of endearment? He calls us friends. Uh, doesn't Christ issue a specific request that we open our hearts to, to him? This is looking more and more like a Christological uh, setting here in the Song of Solomon. Finally, there's the appeal of his hand on the door latch. He, he, he touches the door latch. From uh, verse 4, my beloved put his hand by the latch of the door. 
That is, he, he could have slipped his hand in and, and, you know, lifted up the latch and come on in. But watch, he's a gentleman. He will not go in any place uninvited. So he makes, he makes these six appeals. Some would say, some would say that his very absence would be an appeal. The very fact that the bride and the groom are parted might be considered an appeal because the bride and the groom should be together. So in any event, you either have seven, seven appeals as a number of completion, which would compel the, the bride to open the door, or you've got six appeals as a number of, listen, incompletion. This says something could have happened that didn't happen. Now, I, I maintain that all of these are appeals that Christ makes to the believer, that these are appeals, or more pointedly, that Christ is making to the church, that the church open itself up to Christ. Now, watch this. For all of these appeals, each of which, by the way, is compelling, that any, any one of which of these appeals should have been sufficient for the, the Shulamite to have opened the door, right? Still, what does she do? She's dithering. She, she's, she's dithering. She says, I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? Yeah, that's a, that's a toughie. Uh, yeah, oh, I've, I've taken off my robe. How on earth could I possibly put my robe back on? Please right? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? So the idea here is, is she's washed her feet and um, doesn't want to walk across the floor to go open the door. Now, you and I, we, we know flimsy excuses when we hear them, right? These are flimsy excuses. And you know what? You know what else? By the way, this reminds me of the parable that Jesus told of the, uh, the guests who were invited to the wedding feast and they started making up flimsy excuses. Oh, I bought some land and I have to go see it. I can't go to the wedding. Oh, I just bought a team of oxen and I have to go test them so I can't go to the wedding. Oh, you know, I just got married so I can't go to the wedding. All of those were flimsy excuses that anyone would be able to see through. And I, I think right here, what we have is perhaps another echo of that, that these, that the, the Shulamite is just kind of, you know, dithering. Um, yeah, she hears him. Yeah, that's his voice. Yeah, he's calling me sweetie pie and all, all that other stuff. Um, but she's not answering the door and she's not answering the door because of her own self-interest. She's, she's too preoccupied with herself and her own indulgence and her own comfort. So by the way, she's so worried about her own comfort and indulging her own leisure, right? That she's completely ignoring that her spouse is out there in, you know, his not, the rain, but he's out there in the damp of the night, you know, in the near east, the dew falls, and it's like it's chilly and, and uncomfortable to, to be outside. And I'm just wondering, is that the way we often treat Jesus? We're too preoccupied with our own comfort. We're too preoccupied with what we've got going on. Yeah, yeah, I hear there's somebody at the door. Yeah, yeah, it's the voice of Jesus speaking to me. But rather than open the door and enjoy that full communion, rather we dither around the edges. We find other things to do. Yeah, 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 I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Yada, yada. Then watch. Then watch. Finally, she goes to the door. Finally, she goes to the door. She gets her robe on. She gets her slippers. She shuffles across the, what, you know, six or seven steps to get to the door. But watch. Verse 6 says, I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. Oh, my goodness. Now, 
right here, we're talking about the tragedy of too late. Of too late. Now, people can be of a couple different theological uh, points of view on the, the whole topic of too late. Can you ever be too late? And I, I think what we're, we're seeing here is that at least in some regards, you know, if we don't seize opportunities when they present themselves, perhaps it's too late. Here we've got the Savior knocking at the door. And, and let, me put it, let me put it this way. Maybe in terms of salvation, we understand that, that God is gracious, God is merciful, God's persistent. We understand all those things. But, but let me make the case perhaps a little differently. What if God has a particular ministry set aside for you? God has given you all of the gifts, graces, talents, insight, wisdom to perform a particular ministry that only you can perform. And instead of responding to that invitation to minister, we put off God. And we say, well, I'm busy right now. Well, sometimes that opportunity may not last. Sometimes opportunities have an expiration date on them. That boat may sail. You know, we may not be able to, to do what it is that God's calling us to do. We, we could do it. We decide not to. Reminds me of the story of uh, the, the elderly missionary had been a missionary in India for her entire career. Uh, and this is actually uh, a story I believe Amy Carmichael related at, at one point. Famous missionary. Uh, the, the, the woman, she was a single woman, and she had been a missionary in India all of her life. And someone had asked her, didn't you ever want to be married? And, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to have been married. And I prayed that God would call someone to come and be alongside me as a missionary. And... The, the, the interviewer, the, the woman said to the missionary, the older, elderly by this time, female missionary, said, well, did it ever break your heart that God never answered that prayer? And she said, oh, no. God certainly answered that prayer. I prayed that God would call someone. God called. He just never answered. The missionary person who would have been her mate just simply never answered the call of God. God always calls. Sometimes we don't always answer. So it, at any rate, we've got this situation where the beloved has been knocking and, and trying to gain entry and, and so on and so forth. By the time the Shulamite responds, he's gone. And so she, in desperation, because she, she loves him, but she had just dithered time away. She, she goes out to pursue him. I called him. He gave me no answer. The watchmen who went about in the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. Now, I want to pause right here to reinforce my contention that what's happening here is a dream sequence. Remember, we talked about time passing from between verse 1 and verse 2. And that time could have been a several months, could have been a year or so. By that time, Solomon would have been king, and the Shulamite then would have been queen. If the Shulamite, unusual though it may have been for her to leave the house, leave the palace at night, I think it very unlikely that the watchman would actually have beaten the queen if she was out at night. Um, that makes me think this is a dream, that she's relating a dream. Um, that, that's, once again, you know, the, the day will come when all will be revealed to us, but I really think that what's happening here is we're getting the report of a dream. By the way, it might be very interesting to compare this encounter that the Shulamite has with the watchman with the encounter that she had earlier in chapter 3, verse 3, which the, with the watchman of the city. Because remember, this is not the first time that the Shulamite has gone out at night. She went out that first time in chapter 3, verse 3, and like the, the watchmen are figures of protection and security. Here, the watchmen beat her. 
and they, they bruise her. And it's like, whoa, what, what's up with that? So once again, that, that lends to me that we're probably talking about a dream sequence here. We continue in verse 8, in which the Shulamite says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I'm lovesick. Right? So she's telling the daughters of Jerusalem, if, if you find my honey, if you find my sweetheart anywhere, out around, wherever you are, tell them I'm lovesick. Now listen to the reply of the daughters of Jerusalem. Right? Now, review. Just, just go back in your mind a little bit. The daughters of Jerusalem are these, these other women. They're peers in Jerusalem. They're, they're basically the same age, kind of the similar status of the Shulamite. They have always been supportive of her. They have always shared her joy. They have always been, you know, deeply um, expressing admiration for her, admiration for uh, her beloved. They've been supportive of the whole thing. But watch in these verses in verse 9. This is the daughters of Jerusalem speaking. What is your beloved more than another beloved, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved so that you charge us? Whoa. Um, basically, what the daughters of Jerusalem are saying is, so what's so great about him? You know, heretofore, they've been enthusiastic, they've been supportive, they've been all that. Here, they're saying, meh. You know, the beloved, eh. Everybody's got a beloved. What's, what's so special about your beloved? Now, once again, this may, well, this may well be a part of the dream. Because, you know, in a dream, things can be topsy-turvy. Things can be set upside down pretty quickly. So I, I take this to be part of the dream sequence, right? Now, we continue. And the Shulamite responds to kind of the throwdown, kind of the, the challenge by the daughters of Jerusalem, because they say, what's so great about him? The Shulamite responds in verses 10 through 16 with the longest, most extensive description of physical appearance of any person in the Old Testament. This is the longest physical description of a person in the Old Testament. Listen to what she says. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy, as black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banked of scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, notice, notice how the description goes in verse 10 all the way through verse 16. Verse 10 begins, he is chief among 10,000. And in verse 16, he is altogether lovely. Once again, those are descriptors that the hymn writers, you know, quite frequently apply to Jesus Christ. Fairest of 10,000 and altogether lovely. So in this, this entire passage, um, what we find, we find something remarkable going on. First of all, we find on a very literal basis, the Shulamite is saying, is praising the physical beauty of her beloved. You know, making comments about his head, his hair, his eyes, his cheeks, his lips, his hands, his body, his legs, his face, his mouth. You know, 10 attributes. And then she says, he is altogether lovely. And this is my beloved, and this is my friend. So it's a, a reaffirmation. She is articulating her love for the beloved, even though she has treated him some kind of way by not answering the door and allowing him to come in. Now, 
two items, two items to reflect upon here. The first is how this dream sequence works, if it's a dream sequence. So understand that sometimes in dreams, we turn things upside down. Sometimes in dreams, we, we need to have the ability to see things from a different point of view. So it may be that this, this entire thing is a, a, a what if dream. What if this happened? What if, what if my beloved came to me and I dithered around and when I finally got around to it, I missed it? You know, uh, but by the way, have you ever had those dreams where it's like in your dream, you're trying to get to some place, you're trying to arrive somewhere, and then there's all these different things that get in the way, you know, like a pursuit dream. You're, you're trying to get to your goal, but oh my goodness, you have to overcome this, this, and this. Maybe there's something like that going on here. Uh, so the Shulamite is able to explore this different dimension of the relationship. Now, also, let me go back uh, because one other item that we may need to take a look at, I, I, I use the phrase in describing this chapter, I use the phrase, the honeymoon is over. And the idea that the, uh, some, some interpreters take this pretty literally, pr pretty straightforward, that the, uh, the beloved, basically just to boil it right down, the, the beloved is wanting to come in for romance with the Shulamite. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right? But honeymoon's over and the Shulamite says, I've got a headache, you know, go, you know, don't bother me, I've got a headache. So th that's, that's one interpretation of what's going on here in this particular passage. So maybe it could be that, it could be that this is a spurned, uh, a, a approach for sexual intimacy. And then it's got other repercussions down the way. And, and the repercussions are, wait a minute, oh my goodness, I do love him. Uh, you know, I was wrong to have sent him away, so on and so forth, that, that sort of thing. So whether you take this as based upon a uh, sexual adjustment in marriage, maybe one's sexual appetite is exceeding the other's sexual appetite, and there are adjustments in marriage, we could, we could look at it through that lens. Or if we want to look at it through the lens of a, a dream exploration of what uh, uh, Carl Jung might have called kind of the shadow self, not, not, not deep into the shadow self, but just kind of an alternative self, we could see it as a, a dream sequence. By the way, if we want to see it as a, a representation, to some degree, of Christ's appeal to our hearts. I believe we can see that as well. You know what? They've, they've said that every scripture has 70 interpretations, that there's 70 shades of meaning or 70 facets that we can look at and, and understand the word through different interpretations and understandings. I hope that is the case for you as we continue to study through the Song of Solomon. It's not given to quick and easy responses. It's not given to digital yes or no. This means this definitively, or that means that definitively. But this is a wonderful text for exploration and for tests, hypotheses, see how this topic gets handled. So I, I hope, I hope we're, we're approaching the text from that type of perspective in which we're really seeking for the text to speak to us. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this remarkable book in the Bible. We thank you for the Song of Solomon. We thank you for the relationship lessons that we can gain. We thank you, Lord, for the, the light that it sheds upon the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who indeed stands at the door and knocks. We pray, Heavenly Father, for each and every member of this study. We thank you for their participation. Pray that you would continue to illumine them Lord, just shine the light of your Holy Spirit in their lives. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, from Louisville, Kentucky, and the St. Stephen Church, this is Ken Jobst with the Generations Bible Study. Look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.